Welcome to the New Church Podcast. Well, good morning, everybody. Again, um, you know, everything we're doing today, everything that's happening is, it is war. It is a battle against all of the darkness and the evil and what what the world is trying to do to destroy our faith and to keep us from living and serving God. So that's really good that we're here and this is amazing, but I just want you to know that everything we're doing is like uphill, like we are fighting against the powers of this world. So as we get ready to hear the word of God, let's enter this time with prayer. Father in heaven, please prepare our hearts and our minds to be open to what you have to say to us today. Help us to hear, to be inspired, to be challenged, to be comforted, to be transformed by your word and by faith in Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Okay, so truth, truth has been dying a slow death for years. Comedian Stephen Colbert, he picked up on this and he coined the word truthiness. Truthiness, which was actually Webster's word of the year in 2006. It's like the truth, only it's not quite true. But like Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? Not even children believe in the truth fairy. Jad Abumrad, he's the host of a show called Radio Lab. Um, it's one of the most popular shows on public radio. And he's the son of a scientist and the son of a doctor. And he's done hundreds of sciencey, neurosciencey, very heady, brainy stories that always resolve in this feeling of wonder. In 2012, they interviewed a guy who described chemical weapons being used against him and the people in his village in southwest, southeast Asia. Well, Western scientists, they went there and they tested for chemical weapons, but they didn't find any. And in the interview, the, the, uh, the man said, the scientists must be wrong. But Jad said, but they tested. The science says you're wrong, sir. He said, I don't know. I, I don't care. I know what happened to me. And they went back and forth in the interview And it ended in tears. And Jad said he felt horrible about that. Like hammering at a scientific truth when someone has suffered. Man, that's not going to heal anything. It's not going to help anything. He said maybe he was relying too much on science to know what truth is. A lot of people think there's an inherent conflict between faith and science. But there's not really a conflict between faith and science, unless we forget which one is in charge. Because to understand anything, anything, we've got to start with God. All science can do is observe and measure and name the things that God has already created. You know who the first scientist was? It was Adam. God put him in a garden with a bunch of creatures and he told him to give them names. That's all science really does. And we get in trouble when we mix faith and science. Actually, what I mean by that, when we put our faith in science instead of letting our faith inform scientific understanding and wonder. True objective science, it wants to limit itself to observable facts. It doesn't make pronouncements about the origin of reality. It's not interested in things it can't prove. It doesn't make statements that require faith. I watched the vice presidential debate the other night. And there were a couple times when Harris said, I believe in science. I believe 
in science. What a strange thing to say. Why would science require belief? Why do facts require faith? Here's the definition of science. Science is the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. Christians don't have anything to fear from science because we know God created that natural world that science is observing. And we know if they look long enough and careful enough, they're going to come to that place of mystery that leads them to wonder and to faith. The heavens declare the glory of God. The earth proclaims his handiwork. Someone made all of this. Someone holds all of this together. But modern man, see, modern man has traded his worship of the ancient false gods for the modern false gods of sci-fi and fantasy, where scientists are the wizards and the high priests of their empty religion. They say they only believe what they can see with their eyes. Well, unless one of those wizard scientists tells them about subatomic particles or quantum anomalies, dark matter, black holes, theories of macro evolution, origin of the species, big bang, all these guesses they make for how the world came into existence and how life might have began. Because when they remove God from the picture and they start making stuff up It's not science anymore. That's a new religion. Scientism or something. It's a make-believe world of pure imagination. Truthiness. It requires the kind of blind faith that simply believing in God, who created all of this, doesn't. Faith should be reserved for God. Science needs to stay in its lane. Observable facts don't require faith. Proper science is observing and measuring and naming things. It only goes bad when they come up with theories that attempt to leave the creator out of the equation. So many people trust in scientific observations, which are constantly being outdated and updated, that they fail to see God's eternal truth. Like it says in Romans, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. It's a blurry line between trusting scientists for science and following them into wild speculations. When the same scientist who confidently explains the structure of an atom having protons, electrons, and neutrons, when they go on to teach how the universe began with every speck of its energy jammed into a very tiny point that exploded with unimaginable force, creating matter and propelling it outward to make billions of galaxies they move from science to faith, from truth to truthiness, from scientific fact to science fiction. But that's what people do. I mean, we go to ridiculous measures to ignore the blatantly obvious truth that God created the world, that He's holy and we're not. That we need to change our behavior and trust in him. That we need to repent and believe. Romans 1.18 says, 
says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. There is a God who made the universe, and his ancient name is Yahweh. He is triune, trinity, three persons, one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Father sent the Son into the world that he created, named him Jesus. Jesus lived, taught about the kingdom of God, died on a cross, rose from the grave, ascended back into heaven where he returned to the Father and then sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in all the baptized believers on earth to make them holy and to give them the promise of eternal life. So believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus, and you will be saved. That's the Christian faith in a nutshell. But Frank, that just doesn't sound very scientific. How can I believe in Jesus? How can I believe all those supernatural things? How do I know Jesus even existed for real? Now, if I told you that Abraham Lincoln never existed, that he was just made up, you would think I was crazy, right? But you never met him. You just believe what you've been told. Same thing goes for any historical person. And the further back you go, the less evidence we have that they existed at all. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Caesar, Nero, Shakespeare, why do we believe those people really existed? I mean, history isn't like other sciences because we can't observe it. We can't do experiments that are repeatable. No, with history, we just have to look for evidence. Did they write anything? Did other people know them? Did they write about them? We have photos of Honest Abe. Lots of people knew him and they wrote about him. He actually wrote things himself. We have copies of his writings. So we're pretty confident that Abraham Lincoln really existed. But with Shakespeare, you know, there's not a single manuscript that exists. Not one couplet or sonnet. There is no hard evidence that the person most people think is the greatest author in the English language ever wrote a complete sentence. Most people still believe in Shakespeare, though. And nobody doubts whether Plato and Aristotle, whether they really existed. Even though we've only got a few manuscript fragments of their writings and their copies from several hundred years after they died. But see, other people claimed to know them and to have met them. And so we consider it a fact that they were real people. That's how history works. We go by the evidence. Well, here's the thing, my friends. Jesus is easily the most historically validated person of the ancient world. No historian would dare say anything else unless they want to be thought of as a crackpot who has an ax to grind. I read a book a couple years ago. It was called, Did Jesus Really Exist? The Historical Argument for Jesus of Nazareth, written by Dr. Bart Ehrman, professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina. He's not a Christian, he's not a person of faith, but he argues that anyone who is skeptical of Jesus, the historical person from Nazareth, who started a religion called Christianity, is simply ignoring clear evidence. There's too many ancient writings from quality sources to have any historical doubt about whether Jesus actually existed or not. Here's a couple examples. The Roman historian Flavius Josephus, 
He's one of the most important Jewish historians of the ancient world. And he lived in Jerusalem right after Christ's crucifixion. He wasn't a Christian, but he wrote about the death of James being killed by the Jewish high priest. And he says that James was the brother of Jesus who was called Christ. Another Roman historian, Cornelian Tacitus, he also lived right after the time of the Gospels. And he wrote about Tiberius Caesar and Pilate, about how they were in power when Jesus was crucified. He talks about the growth of Christianity in those few years after Jesus died and the remarkable resolve of the believers in that early church. Testimonies of ancient historians show that even those outside of the early church recognized Jesus to have been a historical person. There's just no good reason at all to deny the historical existence of Jesus. Which is all the more amazing when you think about Jesus from a natural human perspective poor Jewish man from a nothing town. He shouldn't have even been a blip on the radar from a historical perspective. But he has clearly been more than a blip. (laughs) And then there's all the writings of the New Testament. St. Paul. St. Paul was a Jewish radical. He hated Jesus. He wanted to destroy the church. He was making it his life's work to kill Christians. But then he says that Jesus appeared to him and changed his mind. Instead of opposing the church, Paul became the main missionary of taking the gospel to the Roman world, the pagan world. And in the New Testament, we've got 13 surviving letters that he wrote to some of those churches he planted. Paul personally knew Peter, James, other of the apostles and eyewitnesses to Jesus. All of his writings, they say Jesus existed as a real person. But they also say he was the Messiah, the Christ, that he was the divine son of God, that he was crucified, that he rose again. Professor Ehrman says you can't explain the crucified Messiah as something that would would have been made up Because it's hard to imagine Jews inventing the idea of a crucified Messiah. So the idea had to come from a historical reality, something that happened. There really was a man named Jesus who was killed for claiming he was God. No Jew would have invented that. Then there's the book of James, the book of Jude. Those are two books in the New Testament written by half-brothers of Jesus. They would have known him really well. There's the four Gospels, which are like biographies of Jesus' life and samples of his teaching. And they were written and they were distributed. Along with the letters of Paul and Peter, they they were being read out loud in Christian worship services like this. While all the people who are mentioned in those biographies were still alive, all the eyewitnesses of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, they were still around. Paul talks about more than 500 people who had seen Jesus after he rose from the grave. And there's not a single word that's written by someone saying that's not the way it happened. You know that? None of those eyewitnesses said, no, that never happened, those Christians. No one disputed it, at least not in the ancient world. A lot of people over the years have tried to disprove and tear down the Christian faith since then. But kind of like the Apostle Paul and St. Augustine and C.S. Lewis and Josh McDowell and so many others who have tried to disprove Jesus, when they look carefully at the evidence, they end up finding him. They end up finding out Jesus is real instead. The comedian Louis C.K., he said, he teaches his kids that there are many religions in the world. 
and they're all equal. But the Christians are the main one. <laughs> the Christians won. They're the winners. So act accordingly. Congratulate Christians when you meet them because they won the world. He says it's true. The Christians won a long time ago. And if you don't believe me, let me ask you a question. What year is it? I mean, according to the entire human race. And why? It's the year 2020. And we're counting the years since what? Since there were people? Since the sun did something? No. No, not at all. It's been 2,020 years since Christ was here. I mean, everyone, scientists, historians, everyone counts this way. One, two, come on, Africa. Three, four, Asia, India, everyone together now. 2018, 2019. It's been 2,020 years since Jesus was here. Jesus reset the clock. And the years before that, they go backwards now. They count down to when he came. Oh, but Frank, science, history, how can I believe in Jesus? How can I believe all these things about him? How can we know he ever really even existed? Okay. How about this? You do know. You might not want to deal with it. But you know. You've got a lot of denying to do if you're going to pretend like Jesus didn't exist. And if he did exist, well, then you've got a whole bunch of other things you're going to have to deal with. Because he said he was Lord and God. And everything in the world rides on whether you believe that or not. Everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. So, if he existed, and he's who he said he was, then we're going to need to take him at his word. All of his teachings... They were passed down to us by the disciples, the apostles. We have to believe that New Testament they left for us because it tells us about Jesus. We have to believe the Old Testament because Jesus said that it testifies to him, that it's fulfilled in him. It's all about him, points to him. But I hear people say they don't trust the Bible because the Bible is just a book that was written by man how do we know that it really tells us what Jesus said and what Jesus did? Remember how there were no copies of Shakespeare's manuscripts, none? Only a couple hundred copies of Plato and Aristotle? Well, the New Testament has been preserved in more manuscripts than any other ancient work. I mean a lot more. There are more than 5,800 Greek manuscripts. There are more than 10,000 Latin manuscripts and over 9,000 in other various languages like Syriac, Slavic, Gothic, Ethiopic, Coptic, Armenian. These are all copies of the New Testament. They all say the same thing. They all point to the historical authenticity of the Christian faith. A pastor I like a lot, his name is Vodi Bauckham. He defended his, ba his faith when he was studying for his PhD at Oxford. And he said this, he said, the Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in the fulfillment of specific prophecies and claimed that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. 
which is just a rewording of the text that Kemper read earlier from 2 Peter. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. You must pay close attention to what they wrote For their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and Christ, the morning star, shines in your hearts. Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. The Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in the fulfillment of specific prophecies and claimed that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. And it all points to Jesus. The Bible is 66 different books written on three continents in three languages by more than 40 authors. Most of them never met each other. Written over a period of about 1,500 years. And yet it tells one story pointing to one man who was the Messiah, the Son of God, named Jesus Pay close attention to what they wrote because their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns when Christ, the morning star, shines in your hearts. Jesus really existed. He is who he says he is. The Christian faith is true. Truth exists In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Do that with gentleness and respect. You have to be ready to defend your faith. We have the special favor of God because of Jesus. And so God has chosen me to defend the faith. And he's also chosen you. Amen. If these online resources have been meaningful to you, please consider going to newchurch.love slash give, and show your support by helping make this ministry possible. Thank you.